Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming tonight. Prior to the introduction, how many people were actually familiar with Bike Lane Uprising? Can you raise your hand? All right, pretty good. Some of them I forced to come in the back, um, so that's good. Uh, so out of everybody in this room, we kind of saw how many are cyclists. Uh, there's a pretty dynamic group in this room, um, some of which may have seen portions of the presentation before, so bear with me. All right, uh, so Bike Lane Uprising, um, I am the founder, and uh, what is it? It is a crowdsource uh, civic tech platform, and it allows us to take all of the bike lane obstructions submitted by members and put them in one central database. And from that, we can learn a lot. We can identify a lot of insights and we can use that to actually hold uh, violators accountable. Uh, so why did I start bike lane uprising? Uh, because of the driver of this truck, not the truck itself. Um, the truck in the photo that you're seeing going under uh, Lower Wacker is a commercial truck. It was for a beer company, and I was stopped in a bike lane. I was, I was waiting for the red light to turn, and this truck entered into my bike lane, and it entered in so far into the bike lane that it, it was right hooking me, and I was, um, I was starting to go under the, the back wheels of the, the truck. Uh, the driver ended up so far into the bike lane that he not only was illegally into the bike lane, but he actually went onto the sidewalk onto my right. I was on a divvy at the time, and for people in this audience, you're probably familiar that divvies don't actually move that quickly. They don't turn on a dime. Um, so, you know, it's one of those situations where you have to respond very quickly. Uh, luckily, um, I am okay, uh, but with my, uh, my general sense of moxie, uh, I chased after the truck for a couple of blocks, uh, and I caught up with the truck uh, right before they were going under Lower Wacker right there. I, uh, I, I got the driver to roll down their window. I asked them, do you realize that you almost ran me over? I did not swear. I did not yell. I was just very, you know, matter of fact. And the driver, stone -faced, responded to me, yes and then he took off again. I tried very creatively to try and reach out to the company that that driver worked for, and I was never able to get past uh, the receptionist until just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we have actually submitted our story uh, about why Bike Lane Uprising was submitted to the company uh, behind uh, this incident, and um, they have actually been reported to our database three times since then. Uh, but, Two weeks after that incident, I was actually, oh, also, um, when I was biking, I was actually biking to the Merchandise Mart. Um, so I was going to Neocon, um, so kind of odd story. Uh, but two weeks after that happened, um, the cyclist in the photo here uh, was killed in a very similar circumstance. She was right hooked. Uh, it was on a divvy. It was in a construction zone, and um, it was by a commercial vehicle. So it was something that stuck with me for quite a while. And while the driver, you know, kind of long forgot the incident that he almost ran me over, it stuck with me. And uh, it was also kind of strange because how could this be? You know, Chicago in that particular year was ranked number one in the United States for best biking city. And, you know, while we are very lucky and, you know, one day a year, this is what that street looks like, um, you know, in reality, there's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, cyclists uh, are still losing their lives, many more are injured. Uh, I had a one year anniversary party for Bike Lane Uprising uh, last month, and I got a text message today from somebody who stated that they were, they were very sorry that they couldn't um, attend because they actually got doored. Um, so it's something that is very close to the community of the cyclists that submit to the database. Uh, some of them have had, you know, multitude of incidents themselves, and it's something that's just constantly happening. Um, and this particular summer was pretty horrible. Uh, there were a lot of cyclist deaths and pretty severe injuries around the, the Chicago area. But we have hundreds of miles of bike lanes in the city of Chicago. Bike lanes, for those of you that are not um, familiar with the biking scene, uh, they do make it safer to cycle. They do reduce the barrier of entry for more people to pick up um, biking in the city of Chicago. And it's also illegal to stop, stand, hover, drive, you name it, in a bike lane. And it's actually punishable by uh, a $150 ticket or a $300 ticket 
or a potential towing. Uh, but our bike lanes don't always often look like this. They often look like this. Um, you can see that you know, even if you paint the lines, even if you put the, you know, the bollards up, even sometimes if you put the curb protected um, you know, reinforcements up, you still get people that will go around them. Um, some people, you know, it works, it's just enough, but other people need a little more um, enforcement. And as I did research, I, you know, I found people online in forums. I, you know, tried to interview people of what the situation was, and I kept on hearing over and over and over that I feel like nobody cares. And in the city of Chicago, um, I think it's pretty clear that there's a lot of contention between uh, cyclists and drivers. Uh, it's really no surprise, and it it gets heated. And over the course of the summer, I would say that that tension, you know, builds and builds. And you know, after the cyclists are, you know, feeling that nobody's listening to them over and over and over. Over, um, a lot of cyclists have been known to take matters into their own hands and to be quite honest that's probably not safe for anybody either and one of the things that I've heard that since I you know created bike lane uprising is that cyclists have stated that instead of hitting the car on their way you know past it and you know yelling at the car a lot of them actually say you know i just feel like i'm i'm able to have that cathartic moment by submitting to the database later on so it's allowing you know us to kind of diffuse that situation uh, so how it works it is member-based um, i have i've made it a priority that the data that comes into the database uh, needs to be secure, it needs to be accurate, and it needs to be quality data. And to do that, um, I, have, uh, I have had it be member-based. That allows me to keep cyclists anonymous. It allows me to keep them safe. But it also allows me to reach out should there be a reason to. Um, oftentimes, uh, I don't know as much about the situation that the cyclists do that are actually biking in those locations. So oftentimes, if I reach out to a company, they, they find it very useful to get more information from the cyclists. And um, when you go out, you take photos, you then upload it to the database along with some um, other information. And in one year, in, we were able to collect over 4,600 submissions. And that was including the research period. So when only five people were invited to participate to Bike Lane Uprising, that counts in that one year. As of right now, it's actually, as I was heading here, the database, uh, it was at 5,200. But with that 4,600, that's equivalent to as much as $1.3 million in unrealized revenue, specifically more towards the city of Chicago um, fines. And that's 1.1 million in the city of Chicago of unrealized revenue. And the reason that is, is because there's, you know, there's a few different ticket zones. And a majority of the, the submissions that have been reported to the database have come out of uh, the Chicago area. And with that, so people submit to the database, it gets collected in this one central location, and from that, um, we visualize the data. We do it a few different ways, um, and we try to find ways to really allow us to have you know, more insights about what's going on. We use pinpoint maps, but for anyone that's done pinpoint maps in this room, you probably realize that if you, know, you have a problem location, all of your pinpoints, if it has the same address, they're all gonna end up right on top of each other. So you might have 150 you know, submissions, which you know, that's a lot, but if they're all with the same address, it's gonna look like one. So not always the greatest opportunity, but if you then pair that with a heat map, you can see, okay, well, maybe there's something going on in this area you know, where the heat map's a little bit stronger. And between the two, you can find some really interesting insights. And because we have those photos to go along with it, we get you know, the, the analytical data, that quantitative, but then we also have the qualitative. So we have the photos. So when people wanna play devil's advocate, that's like, oh, well, where are they supposed to park if, you know, if the bike lane's the only you know, thing available? From the photos, we can actually state, you know, actually there's a lot of parking spaces available typically. And that's usually what gets people submitted to the database because it's egregious. It, you had something legally available, but you chose not to park in it. That's what gets cyclists irritated enough to submit most of the time. 
Uh, and we have this uh, new ticket zone. Uh, so in the city of Chicago, uh, within the central business district, it has been modified. It does not include uh, one ward and uh, the alderman of that ward specifically requested that his ward be removed. Because of that, no one knows what the map really looks like. Um, this is, I would say, probably one of the few maps that are probably trying to be created. Um, I have been working with the city of Chicago to you know, make sure that this map lines up with the data that they have to see, you know, based on our submissions, how many are coming within that $300 zone versus the $150 um, zone and actually have it signed off on. Um, but it makes it very confusing to enforce a $300 ticket zone if no one has a map. Uh, and also, by collecting in one central database, it allows us to fight against you know, some of these companies that are repeat offenders in multiple cities together. So one thing that I should probably point out, I started this myself and I had no idea that it was gonna spread outside of Chicago. And uh, it spread via word of mouth uh, to cyclists in over 50 cities. Uh, people from other states, other countries have joined on and even a couple of continents. And Cisco is available and drives in all of you know, the continental you know, United States and they park in all of our bike lanes. So we can you know, go and talk to them together instead of you know, Tennessee by themselves, Chicago by themselves, and DC by themselves. Uh, and you know, there's really no point for me to be collecting all of this data if we're not gonna do anything with it. So you know, the idea is that we're collecting it, we're building relationships to really um, you know, have that collective voice, that collective mission, and um, be something that people take seriously. So you know, I've really been working to form relationships with um, people in um, decision-making positions to actually get something done about these. Uh, so a little bit of an insights on the dashboard. Uh, I have been very busy in the past year. Uh, I have, um, within the city of Chicago specifically, uh, I've connected with at least um, seven individuals from CDOT, multiple meetings. Uh, I've met with at least two people from the Department of Finance. Uh, UIC police are not up there, I, didn't, I ran out of room. Um, four aldermen, two um, uh, people from CTA. Uh, countless companies, uh, countless biking organizations, and um, you know, while this has spread via word of mouth to you know other cities, Chicago is still primarily the main um, source of the submissions coming into the database. It accounts for 79% um, of all submissions. This is within the last year, um, and then that was within the one year span that was 3,700 submissions so that's 1.1 million dollars in potential unrealized revenue and then who are the repeat offenders so as of you know prior to this i had no idea we all had a feeling that it was probably uber and lyft but we really didn't know you know with hard facts so from the breakdown, when people submit to the database, they're supposed to select one of five categories that that obstruction falls into. It's either taxi, Uber, Lyft, and livery, private owner vehicle, um, company, municipal, or other. And other can be, you name it, it can be a construction site, it can be um, a pedestrian. We have a turtle in the database. Somebody thought it was quite hilarious. Um, someone did ask about adding a peacock. Um, but within the taxi, Uber, Lyft, and livery category, I should kind of define this a little bit more, how we go to, through that categorization. So one, submitters select that category themselves. It's really up to them to define it. And when they select a taxi or, or an Uber, um, it's usually because there is some sort of a sticker. And you know, either they felt it was or who knows what, but private owner vehicles oftentimes are Ubers and Lyfts that maybe they didn't actually get to see the sticker because it was too far away. So we usually err on the side if you didn't see a sticker, you know, mark it as a private owner vehicle. But, you know, there are those instances that somebody could be driving for Uber or Lyft and, um, you know, it, they weren't actually doing a, a fare at that particular moment. But we do mark them as taxi, Uber and Lyft because um, they did get the same training. Um, oh, actually, and I will point out that while the municipal 
uh, is a smaller percentage. It is 6%. I do have a very, very strong issue with the 6% because we as the city of Chicago should be um, placing a very good example for everybody else around. If the city of Chicago does not follow um, and lead in a good example of what the laws are, people behind them you know will just follow suit when you see one car parked in a bike lane you immediately see a line of more cars pull up if you if no one parks in the bike lane it will stay clear and oftentimes i see municipal vehicles with a bunch of private owner vehicles lined up right behind it uh, and uh, we also look at um, repeat offenders by uh, license plate state so where are these people getting their driver's licenses? Where are they registering their cars? When I first started this, I was like, oh, I wonder if maybe it's people from like Michigan or Illinois, like in the Indiana area or you know, somewhere outside of Chicago that maybe they're not familiar with what a bike lane is. And as I uh, began um, you know, tracking this, I was like, oh, no, it's pretty much all Illinois people. And oftentimes, judging from the stickers in the window, you can see that most of them live within the city of Chicago because they have city of Chicago stickers. So um, devil's advocate, people actually do probably know that they are bike lanes. Uh, and um, we can also look at repeat offenders based on the actual license plate. Uh, 140 license plate have been submitted to the database more than once. That makes them a quote unquote repeat um, offender. And those 140 um, license plates have, make up 15% of the database. Uh, one in particular has been submitted to the database 15 times, which could be as much as four and a half thousand dollars in unrealized revenue. And this particular car, the situation is they just park there all day for work. Uh, they learned after the first time that it was free parking and on the second time it was reinforced and on the third time it was reinforced even more so. So not only were they you know, putting cyclists lives at danger but they're also not paying for parking. Uh, so one of the things that happens when people submit to the database is we actually tag those submissions. So if you say company in that category we want to know which company it is, and we'll try to identify that. If you say taxi, Uber, Lyft, and livery, we'll try to find out which one. If you say taxi, we'll try to find out which um, uh, association they're a part of. So we're really drilling it down and drilling it down. Within the top tags of repeat tags, um, Uber is number one, surprise. Um, taxi, second offender, Lyft, number three. I will point out, people do want to add, they always ask about, well, why is Lyft lower than Uber? I would say a couple of things. One, um, I think Uber brands the car more than Lyft does. A lot of people tend to drive for both Lyft and Uber. And I've noticed that um, Lyft stickers, there's usually maybe one sticker on the car and not one on the front and back. And then uh, USPS, uh, which is something that all the cities um, have an issue with. Um, USPS illegally parks in bike lanes, and they actually get very aggressive with cyclists about um, them taking photos. They follow, they scream at cyclists, um, and the cities actually have a very um, big issue actually doing anything about it because they're federal federally protected. Um, and. Uh, we have had some success stories. Uh, Bona Beef. Uh, Bona Beef had parked in the bike lane five times. At no point in time in my life, being a vegetarian of 20 years, did I ever think I would have such a high regard for Bona Beef. <laughs> and uh, I do. They, and they parked in the bike lane five times, and I have such a high regard for them now. Um, that company, uh, we reached out. And I was like, hey, you know, uh, your, your vans have been, you know, parking in the bike lane at this one particular location right around the same time, you know, what's going on? The company responded very, very quickly. And, you know, for being like a smaller franchise, I was pretty impressed. And lo and behold, I thought, okay, you know, based on that um, response, I thought I'm never going to hear from this company ever again. You know, it's all taken care of. Uh, you can tell when some people are giving a real answer and other people are like doing a copy paste kind of situation of like just trying to get you to go away. Uh, but Bona Beef, um, I was actually talking with one of the Bonavellas, so one of the, the family members on the phone. Uh, the very next day, however, I wake up and there's another Bona Beef submitted to the database. And so we go online and we're like, oh, somebody at Bona must not have gotten the message, you know, what's going on? Um, and the company was so embarrassed. 
Uh, they, you know, reached out, we talked about it, and they're like, please let us cater your first event. While this, I have not tried to, you know, extort people into donating things, you know, uh, they, they very much wanted to, and we did allow them to, uh, the, yeah, so. Um, they, they came through, uh, we went to Bike the Drive, it was our first actual um, event, and uh, they came through and they brought sandwiches for people. Uh, we, we, the Porter Product Company, um, didn't think I would have such a high regard for the Porter Product Company. Um, they had been trying to access this construction site for quite a while. They had been parking in the bike lanes. And we know in the city of Chicago and other locations that construction sites are an incredible increased risk for cyclists um, getting injured or killed. And um, it was also at dawn, so it was dark, and it was on a busy street and it was right by an intersection. So it was this threat of multiple you know, things coming together and we reached out and the company you know, was very concerned about it, multiple back and forth, but um, come to find out uh, they did, they were very interested in coming to a solution. Uh, they tried to brainstorm with me. They're like, okay, well, um, does the bike lane ever close? You know, could they come you know, when the bike lane was closed for business? And I was like, well, no, they're actually 24 hours. Um, but you could tell like they were you know very much trying to come up with a solution so um, we brainstormed I had reached out to the submitter because they knew the site much more it was kind of a, a sticky you know situation because of the construction um, but uh, they snapped some photos because the the, uh, the driver started parking in the lane of traffic moved off put a cone out and um, the cyclist actually like stopped and thanked them and shook their hand and um, everyone was happy uh, and uh, from the data that we've collected, a lot of the cities um, that do submit to the database regularly, uh, they have heat maps. And from those heat maps, they're able to kind of pinpoint some problem locations. In DC and some other locations, they've used those pinpoints to actually highlight some problem areas. DC used a people protected bike lane, um, and uh, Nashville has also uh, been able to use that data to get meetings with their police department. For two years, they had attempted to get meetings with their police department and it wasn't until they started submitting to the database and actually showing the data that they were actually able to um, meet with their police department and they met with them twice so far. Uh, and there's companies that really do care even if you make a bonehead move and park in the bike lane in front of a bicycle attorney's office. Um, you know, just because uh, somebody is driving for a company doesn't mean they fully represent the, you know, the values of that company. Um, Apt was very much, um, you know, uh, concerned about this happening. Um, they responded very quickly. Uh, I have talked to them, and at the end, they were like, "And just to let you know, we're supporters of Bike Lane Uprising." I was like, "Very good." Um, and Alderman Riley, um, as well as some other aldermen, have been vocal about their support of Bike Lane Uprising. Uh, sometimes, you know, there's some locations that, you know, if we just call them up, they're not going to respond positively. There was a, a, a location, a restaurant on Randolph that uh, they put out their umbrellas for the summer and they were these massive umbrellas and they covered the bike lane to where it was right around neck height. So when cyclists were going by, so uh, one of the followers on Twitter was like, hey, any, can anybody do anything about this? And um, we tried reaching out to the, the restaurant and they're like, well, they're the same umbrellas. We've done this every year. And it was like, well, there was no bike lane uprising in other years. So um, they didn't really respond. And then um, Alderman Riley actually stepped in, called and uh, responded that the umbrellas were coming down until they could find alternative uh, situations. Uh, and we also run into some companies that they don't necessarily respond to, uh, positively, while for the most part, companies do uh, tend to respond somewhat positively. Um, Alderman Riley did reach out to one that had doubled down in the act of parking in bike lanes, had gotten really unprofessional with um, how they were responding. They got real creative with their gifts and their hashtags and their eye roll gifts and all of that. And um, you know, finally we were just like, whatever, Alderman Riley, you think you can help out with this? And so he responded within the hour and was like, I'm on it. And then an hour after that, he actually responds that his office had contacted the company. The company lied to his office, stated they had not been parking in the bike lane, and then Alderman Riley's office sent them the photos. And uh, so that's that. Um, and then they deleted all of their tweets from the day. Um, all, the whole Twitter war. Um, uh, and then there have been some physical you know, changes that have taken place. So 
in Nashville and in Chicago in the very same day when, um, when NBC did a story on bike lane uprising and the hotspots that we've identified. Uh, the very next week, uh, there were bollards installed for one of the locations. Um, the bollards, yeah, they were kind of far apart, um, but they were, you know, maybe that good, um, that good omen for, you know, the in-between between, between um, Harrison Street is a, is a pretty big problem for bike lane obstructions. But it's also uh, been going under, going uh, through a great deal of construction, and that construction has um, ripped up the street over and over and over. So with that, it's very difficult to put in the the protected um, bike lanes that they're they actually been hoping to install. So probably next year. And then we have actually, you know, been able to, you know, say thank you and not just be like the negative organization and, you know, say thank you when uh, people like CDOT and the Department of Transportation actually meet with us. And with that, I actually got a like from all or from the mayor of Chicago. I almost fell over when I saw that he liked one of my tweets. It was probably one of his staff, but whatever, I'll take it. All right. Uh, and we, I am blown away by the amount of media attention that um, has been spotlighted on bike lane obstructions and bike lane uprising. I started this a year ago, just you know, kind of on a whim uh, at game night with my friends, and um, this is you know, kind of what it's uh, blown up into. And I had no idea it was going to make its way outside of Chicago. I had no idea that it was going to be as popular as it was. And you know, I've kind of spent the past year just trying to catch up with it, especially, you know, once um, summer kind of rolled around. Uh, and with that, you know, as much work as you can do, it's not like we go outside and everything's perfect. Um, you know, it's not, you know, 100% safe for cyclists now, or cyclists now, just because, you know, we've gotten this media attention and, you know, it's been, you know, educated to people through the news that you shouldn't be parking in bike lanes. Um, you know, people still don't care. There are still those people, like the one in the photo. Um, and, you know, there's still cyclists that are being killed. Um, Angela Park was killed not too far from my home. Um, it hit pretty close to home. Um, because it was a known issue. We knew it was a problem. We knew that intersection was a problem. We know construction in the city of Chicago is a problem. It was, you know, a cyclist that was very, you know, familiar with the area and, you know, it can happen to anybody. And the worst part about it is that immediately when I saw the photo of the truck that was involved in the situation, I saw the name of the company and because of the database, I recognized it as a repeat bike lane offender. And I was able to immediately go through the database and make sure that we had accounted for every single um, bike lane obstruction involving Lakeshore Recycling Company. They have, um, they park in bike lanes. They also leave their dumpsters in bike lanes illegally for months on end. And after uh, Angela's death, after they killed Angela Park, uh, they were submitted to the database within two days for parking illegally in bike lanes. They were also spotted blowing through stop signs. And now, so prior to Angela's death, uh, they were submitted to the database three times. After Angela's death, there are at least 14 submissions. And it's become a culture that now when they see cyclists taking photos, they'll start, you know, screaming at cyclists and, you know, kind of like yelling after them to, you know, to stop. Um, so, you know, without the database, we, one, never would have known that that company was, you know, had this um, history, and we wouldn't have known that they were continuing their history afterwards. Uh, like I said, I had no idea most of this was going to happen. I had no idea we were going to, you know, find some of the insights that we found and, you know, be able to, you know, be there in some of those. Uh, terrible situations, um, but you know I'm excited to see the opportunities. Uh, people are listening. Um, the cities are listening to this, and um, I'm excited to continue to build those relationships and find the opportunities for the data. So, thank you. Thank you. That was very informative. Um, I really appreciate it. I learned a lot. Uh, two things I'd like to ask is. One, what's your revenue model look like? Do you, how do you create? I mean, you, obviously, you can't do this for free. Founder so funded. Is it all? It's There's all been some donations as well, but primarily it's founder funded. I have a background in design, research, and um, product management. And for the most part, I do a lot of it myself. Um, and I also pay a person in the audience um, hourly every now and again.
Nice. And the other question I had was actually the technology. You you showed a lot of a lot of the data. How exactly? What I'm more interested of kind of what does the your data look like and how are you managing it? What software are you using to kind of get these, you know, the great uh, answers to the questions? Yeah, so right now um, we're very much in, I would say, the proof of concept. Um, uh, there's submitters in the audience, uh, contributors, and um, I would say that there's a lot of pain points in the process. We've proved, one, that people would submit. Um, we've proved that people would create, um, you know, user profiles. Uh, because there were some concerns that, oh, no one would do that. Oh, no one would take photos. Oh, no one will do that. And it's like, no, actually, they will. Um, they're already doing it on forums and things like that. So as far as the technology base, um, it's pretty lo-fi as of right now. Um, I've grabbed some stuff. I've de so I do not have a development background, but everything, for the most part, that's been created, I have been the one to kind of hobble some things together in very unique ways. Um, and with that being said, you know, we are running into a scaling issue that, you know, we've proven that, yes, people will do this and people want to use it even more. And the easier we make it to submit, the, the faster people will submit, the more people will submit, the better data we will get for some of those insights. Um, I had a question about just the, the breakdown of where people are submitting from. I'm wondering like, if a lot of it gets centralized on the loop versus maybe other parts of the city that uh, might not have access to this sort of website, might not understand it. Um, like I live in Little Village and I'm wondering um, how many people from that part of the city submit. Um, so yeah, so I guess a question of the accessibility and yeah. where you see it so reported. I have tried my best to reach out to people from different neighborhoods. However, um, the data representing here is something that we see the, you know, the, the, you know, the imbalance in pretty much anything that comes from the city of Chicago. So, on your, you know, once you get past um, a certain point on the map, things kind of trail off. Um, so I have reached out to biking orgs like, you know, Slow Roll Chicago and, you know, trying to go to events to actually bring in more people. And when people do sign up, we actually do ask. So one of the reasons also that there's a profile is that we can see where people are biking. And when we get people from, um, you know, underrepresented neighborhoods within our mapping areas, I try to reach out to like let them know so that they can also try to bring more people in. But again, it's the same situation. But one of the things that I will point out is that one of the issues with um, submitting to the city of Chicago is the form you know, asks you for your name, it asks you for your address, it asks you for a lot of personal information. And even though the city of Chicago states that you're not required to submit um, all of that data in order to submit a bike lane obstruction through their um, database, if you do not have legal status in the city of Chicago, it probably doesn't feel that comfortable to submit to the city of Chicago's website as well. So by anonymizing some of it outwardly, it allows us to just get data from the people that you know would need to use bike lanes in some of those neighborhoods. One of the metrics you highlight is lost revenue for a city. Do you think that argument is more compelling than safety issues in encouraging a city to act? Unfortunately, yes. Um, ultimately, I'm trying to put Kristen Green out of business, who runs Ghost Bike Chicago. Um, you know, if she doesn't have to put any ghost bikes up for the year, then we've done a good job. But the revenue thing kind of gets people's attention.